This offends me as a poker player, let alone as an investor. Welcome to the Canadian Couch Potato Podcast, where we make you a better investor with index funds and ETFs. I'm Dan Bordelotti, and it's great to have you back for another episode. Over the years, I've spoken to many investors who are attracted to the low cost and broad diversification of the couch potato strategy, but they're uncomfortable with the idea of buying total market index funds because they don't want to invest in certain companies or industries. These might include environmental activists who can't stomach the idea of owning oil companies, or others who don't want to own tobacco companies or weapons manufacturers, or other so-called sin stocks. Of course, many index funds hold hundreds or thousands of companies and you can't pick and choose which ones you want to include or exclude. So can you be a passive investor if you want to stay true to your environmental or ethical principles? Tim Nash says that you can. Tim is the creator of SustainableEconomist.com, a website for those who want to tailor their investment strategy to suit their values. Tim isn't an investment advisor, but he does work with individuals to teach them how they can invest their own money online with sustainable funds, and he offers a number of model portfolios on his site, with names such as Fossil Free Portfolio or The Organic Couch Potato. I first interviewed Tim on my blog back in 2013, and since then he's been my go-to guy whenever I have questions about sustainable investing. So I thought I'd invite him on the podcast so we could talk about these ideas in detail. Now, during our interview, we talk about a number of specific index funds and ETFs, and you'll hear us throw around a few ticker symbols. Don't worry if you don't catch all of these names while you're listening. As always, I'm going to include some show notes on my website, CanadianCouchPotato.com, with links to all of these funds and some other resources as well. My guest on the podcast today is Tim Nash, who is the creator of the website SustainableEconomist.com. And uh, Tim, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I thought I would uh, start by just asking you to explain a little bit about your background and uh, how you got into um, uh, socially responsible investing and what you do these days. Sure. Uh, So I grew up in London, Ontario with my dad in the financial industry. So I grew up around stocks and bonds. In school, I studied economics and philosophy, which put me in a bit, was a bit of a weird one in each of those faculties. Um, and then in my third year, I got accepted to do an exchange to New Zealand. And my intention was just to go and party and play rugby and travel around. And I ended up taking a course in triple bottom line economics. This idea, we all know the single bottom line, which is profit. And so the first time I learned about the triple bottom line, which is people, planet, and profit. And all of a sudden, light bulbs started going off in my head saying, okay, this is sort of some of the problems I was having with our economic system, right? This started to give me the language to deal with those. So uh, I I ended up coming back, graduating with my BA in economics with more questions than I had answers. So I spent a year in Sweden doing my master's in sustainability. And that's where I really started exploring this world of socially responsible investment. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about that term, socially responsible investing. For people who may not be familiar with the concept, it's often called SRI. Tell us a little bit about the basic principles. Sure. So unfortunately, there are lots of words for it. Uh, We can talk about ethical investing, sustainable investing. So really, uh, here in Canada, the beginning of socially responsible investment came out of the Mennonite communities. So we have a big Mennonite community in the Kitchener-Waterloo region, and they were looking for ways to be able to invest their money according to their religious beliefs. And so that was kind of the foundation. So if you look at a lot of the sort of the SRI uh, funds and indices, they tend to exclude what we call the sin stocks, which are going to be things like uh, alcohol, tobacco, gambling, military weapons, certainly, uh, as well as nuclear. Because at the time in, I think it was about sort of the, the late 80s, early 90s, there was a big environmental push against nuclear energy. So that kind of snuck in there. Now, over time, it's evolved a lot. Rather than just this exclusionary of these so-called sin stocks, now people are starting to realize that there is a, a real business case to sustainability. And so we can talk about it through the, the, the lens of rising energy costs and water costs, right? And so companies that are more efficient are going to have less cost there. Their employees tend to be more productive, right? Because people actually want to work and feel good about working there. And their turnover is lower 
So the fact that we've got, uh, uh, you know, the, the costs associated with hiring and training a new employee tend to be really high. And then on the revenue side, we've got customers that are more loyal and often willing to pay a premium for organic, fair trade, ethically sourced goods. So over time, what's happened is this lens of social responsibility that was just very much kind of for religious grounds, people are now starting to look at it through this lens of sustainability, which is about lower costs, higher revenues, and a more productive workforce. So the language we use now is called, it's an acronym, ESG, which stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance Issues. So you still have sort of the ethical investors that are doing for ethical reasons and, you know, kind of this, this moral side. But more and more, we actually have this stricter financial side where people are starting to realize, hey, there's more to a company's future and prospects than just their bottom line and just their earnings, that we want to start looking at how they're treating their employees, how they're treating society, how they're treating the planet. And I would argue right now, very important is their governance structure. Do they have a strong governance structure um, in order to, to make profits well into the future? So this is interesting because you raised a lot of different I issues and concepts in, in your answer to that question, sure. which sort of, to me, pinpoints one of the biggest difficulties with talking to people about SRI is that it means so many different things to different people. I mean, a classic example, I mean, you talked about sort of, you know, gambling, alcohol, tobacco, right. weapons. I mean, as a guy who likes to have a drink and play poker, sure. I'm not going to necessarily be too concerned about having alcohol and gambling stocks in my portfolio. I hear you. But, you know, that's quite different from a company that makes cluster bombs and landmines designed to kill children. So. Correct. It's really a matter of what, you know, what is your ethical values and how do you translate that into an investing strategy? So why don't you talk a little yeah. bit about the challenges of kind of finding indexes and methodologies that are compatible with your values as opposed to some vague, sure. you know, ill-defined uh, definition of what's <laughs> right. SRI. Right. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great point. And all I would say is that as, as I work with different people on these issues, I find it really important to leave my values at the door and that understanding that it really is all about your values and what are the issues that really you care about. So for the purposes of today's conversation, I'll speak to my values mm -hmm. and I'll talk about me as an individual, but just know that, you know, I'm working with a couple right now who are vegan and so they want a vegan portfolio. Now, it's interesting, mm -hmm. you know, because you talked about alcohol and they're fine investing in alcohol. Right. They've got nowhere <laughs> issues with that Alcohol's whatsoever. fine, beef is Sure. Yeah. But they've made a life choice that they're not going to eat meat, that they're not going to support businesses that test things on animals. And so it only makes sense that when they're thinking about their, you know, retirement portfolio, that they would apply that same lens. So for me, it was really, uh, you know, definitely a little bit of a soul searching exercise. Um, but really what it comes down to is uh, transparency of funds. So what I love about ETFs is how transparent they are. And so I, it doesn't matter what the ETF is. I can go on the website and in two or three clicks, I can get the entire list of every holding. And I'll essentially go through that list of holding. And frankly, I'll see what companies make me feel sick. Mm -hmm. And if there's a company in there that I'm just like, oh, and it's a visceral reaction. Like when I see a company that I really, uh, that I would never support with my consumption dollars, which I just really, you know, can't stand. And I see that that's inside the index. I, I get that emotional reaction, as I think a lot of investors do. Um, but the issue is that sadly, you know, not everyone knows sort of all the different companies and what, uh, what companies might be contrary to their values. And then also people, you know, who care about these things don't always understand how ETFs work and that there are these options and that you can go through these lists of companies. So this raises another issue that, you know, we should address. This is a podcast about index investing, about yeah. the couch potato strategy. And once we start talking about including and excluding specific companies, it sounds like we're talking about active investing. Right. It may even sound like we're talking about stock picking. So sure. um, can you talk a little bit about how you feel it is, is it possible to invest using an indexing strategy and still remain true to those SRI objectives. Absolutely. And again, it's going to depend sort of how far down the rabbit hole you as an individual want to go. Mm 
And, you know, certainly there are circumstances where if people have really specific things, the vegan couple is a good example, mm -hmm. where it's going to be really hard to do that just with index ETFs. You might need to start getting some individual companies just to get proper diversification across all the different sectors. Um, but for the most part, uh, with the, a huge plethora of ETFs that are available now, what for me, it's just about simply finding the right indexes, understanding what the companies are that are inside. And certainly diversification is a core value for me in my investment, investment approach. And that's one of the reasons I love sort of uh, uh, index ETF investing because it's so diversified, it's hyper diversified. So for me, the goal becomes how can we be as diversified as possible given your specific ethical constraints. Right. So you're acknowledging that you're not going to be using total market ETFs, but you're saying that you can find some kind of happy medium between active investing and uh, all out indexing, totally. but just finding a broadly diversified portfolio that probably yeah. doesn't have a lot of concentration in any individual company. Correct. Um, and you've just sort of tweaked it. Um, yep. So it's not a purely indexed strategy, but it's pretty close and it allows you to accomplish, you know, your, your other goals. Absolutely. Yeah. And all I would add is that, you know, when it comes to building in indices, and I'm going to use the pl plural indices rather than indexes, but uh, when it comes to building indices that, you know, people use different methodologies. So we kind of gravitate towards these cap weighted uh, uh, indices. But there's nothing really saying that that's necessarily the best approach. So what's interesting is that some of the ETFs that are broad market, that, that would really sort of mirror or provide a very, very similar approach to a, a, a traditional ETF, all they're doing is simply changing the weights on the companies to be able to account for things like their carbon footprint, to be able to account for things like this ESG, Environmental Social Governance Score, so that the companies that are leaders in sustainability have a slightly higher percentage in your portfolio, whereas the companies that are laggards in these areas have a slightly lower percentage. Or if it's, their score is too low, then they might get dropped off the bottom. Okay. So really it's about figuring out what makes sense for you. And certainly if listeners are more interested on the, the sort of the traditional index approach, you can still do that in a socially responsible manner. Um, but it's just acknowledging that sometimes those funds aren't going to go far enough for some people that do have pretty hard line ethical principles and, and, and won't sleep well at night knowing that their money is funding, you know, whether it's cluster bombs or, you know, I had one client whose mom passed away because of lung cancer, mm. right, when she was quite young. So she received this early inheritance, right, this big chunk of money has to figure out how to invest it. And, you know, she opens up some of the traditional investments and, you know, there's Philip Morris. So imagine how that felt. And she's trying to, to do legacy to her mom. So to, to then start to look at and say, okay, we're not going to invest in tobacco because for her, that's an emotional trigger. You know, it's really nice to be able to find ETFs and investment products that are going to allow her to earn market rate returns, but that also she can feel good about. Now that sort of leads into the next question, which is, you know, you had mentioned, you know, if I can invest this way and still earn returns similar totally. to the broad market? That's another question people are going to ask all the sure. time. I, I, I think it's fair to say that um, anytime you use a index fund with an embedded strategy, like a socially responsible screen or something, you're going to pay more than just a plain vanilla index fund. Sure. But I would think most people for whom that is important right. uh, are willing to pay a little bit more for that. Absolutely. But they may not be willing to pay or they may not willing – to uh, be willing to suffer dramatic sure. underperformance compared with the broad market. Absolutely. So um, is it, you know, how possible is it to build a broadly diversified portfolio that you can expect to have a very high correlation with a traditional index portfolio and still adhere to those value principles? Right. It's getting easier and easier. Mm -hmm. We're seeing more and more ETFs coming up across the board. I think we're going to talk about some of the specific ones later on. Mm -hmm. But it's now absolutely possible to build a, a completely socially responsible portfolio that gives you the same diversification, that gives you the same market exposure, and that will earn you the same financial returns. Okay. I mean, again, there's really this perception, and it is a, a perception, it's a mindset, that you have to give something up to, to, to align it with your values.
And that's just a, a, a premise that I fundamentally reject. A, the data backs me up. So we can chart and I'm happy to compare the five year, 10 year returns of some of these, you know, longer standing uh, uh, socially responsible ETFs against their traditional counterparts. I'm happy to do that. And I can tell you that there will be a little bit of fluctuation. Uh, basically, you can expect to earn market returns, if not a little bit better, even accounting for the higher fees. Yeah, I would say that too. Like if I was looking at this, you know, with my sort of advisor hat on, yeah. I would not want to see you know, five, 10 year returns for these indexes that were significantly better. Sure. Because that suggests to me there's data mining going on exactly. and there's the potential for severe underperformance in the future. Right. What I would want to see is really high correlation. You got it. And any difference from the benchmark should be not very high up or down in any given year. Exactly. Yeah. So we so we see little things, you know, when the oil market crashed, when when was that? 2012, 2013, whenever that was, the so socially responsible funds tend to be a little bit underweight uh, uh, oil and gas and mining right, tend to be a little more overweight financials and tech, right? So you are going to see those impacts. Uh, it was really interesting to see when Donald Trump won the election, you know, we saw military companies spike up. We saw coal companies and a lot of fossil fuel companies spike up. So in that period, the socially responsible portfolios have underperformed a little bit, but we're talking like, you know, really, really small. I haven't calculated the standard deviation on it, but really we're looking at very, very minuscule tracking errors there, that this is a way to earn market returns uh, in a way that is slightly more in line with your values. And again, it depends on your values, mm -hmm. but certainly the socially responsible ETFs are a little more uh, on the the responsible or the ethical side. Okay. So I think what we should do is jump into discussing some specific products that are available sure. um, for index investors who might be interested in tweaking their portfolios from a sort of traditional approach to a more SRI focus. Um, and I think the best way to do that would be to just work through each of the major asset classes. Okay. Um, because in each case, there's only a small number of products, I think, that that you would be comfortable with. Um, and so we can just spend a couple of minutes on sure. each one. So yeah. let's start with Canadian equities. Now in this space, there is a really well-known uh, index called the Jancy Social Index. It's been around for a long time and yep. it's available in a couple of mutual funds, I believe as well, yep. but it's also available as an iShares ETF with the ticker XEN. So why don't you tell us a little bit about this index and uh, what you like and dislike about it? Sure. That sounds great. So um, yeah, I really love the Jancy Social Index. It was one of the first ETFs that, that uh, came out here in Canada. It was the first socially responsible index here in Canada. So it was started by a guy named Michael Jancy. He was the founder of Jancy Research, which was acquired by Sustainalytics. So what they do with this index is that they've scored all the top Canadian companies on the Toronto Stock Exchange. They give each of them a sustainability score kind of, I think, between one and 100, although it's a little different from sector to sector. It can be tough to compare. And on that sector by sector level, they rank them. And the bottom 20% are excluded. So in terms of the Jancy Social Index, the worst of the worst companies from every single sector are just right out the door. But there's an effort to keep the overall sector mix similar Correct. to the broad market. Is so that the idea? There, it is designed to track the, the TSX 60. So in terms of the asset mix, again, you'll see a little more overweight financials here in Canada, right? And you'll see a little underweight uh, uh, oil and gas and uh, uh, materials. But generally speaking, you're right. It's all to keep it within a range to track the TSX 60. Right. Because of course, financials and energy are by far the two biggest sectors in the Canadian index, exactly. broad, the broad market index anyway. And the Jancy index does not you know, exclude all of the energy companies Correct. or anything like that because it considers them to be environmental Correct. pollutants. It's just excludes the worst offenders and gives a little more weight to the better ones. You got okay. it. Okay. And so really what it does is, is it, it gets rid of the worst of the worst from each sector. As well, what they do is they do what's called a controversy assessment. So these analysts watch the news. And whenever a company is embroiled in a controversy, you know, and I'm sure there are a few that have happened in the last couple of weeks that we can think of, right? Uh, they, that gets assessed. 
and they do research on this environmental, social, or governance controversy. They assess it a, a, a ranking from a category one, which would be a minor indiscretion, maybe a product recall or, you know, sort of a labor market dispute, you know, something minor versus a category five, which would be like a BP oil spill. Right. And any company that has a category four or category five controversy, again, is omitted from the Jancy social index. So that covers Canadian equities. And, and I'll just let listeners know, um, you don't have to be scrolling down all of these ticker symbols. I'm going to be putting uh, links to them on the show notes for this podcast when it comes available. So let's jump to U.S. equities. Um, for U.S. equities, if you're looking for an SRI choice, you got to look to U.S. listed ETFs. There aren't any available in Canada or listed on the TF. TSX. Um, iShares, confusingly, has two different products available, both uh, which track MSCI indexes, but the two indexes are different. So the first ticker symbol is KLD, and the second one is DSI. Can you talk a little bit about the differences between these two funds and what you like and don't like? Sure, absolutely. So DSI uh, refers to the Domini Social Index, which has a very similar methodology as the Jancy Social Index. And really what they're trying to do is to replicate the S&P 500, right? Same weightings, uh, same allocations, but again, getting rid of the worst of the worst companies, and as well, any companies that are embroiled in these really nasty controversies. So that's got, I believe, about 400 companies inside of it. DSI has 400 companies. And really, again, that's if, if you want something that's going to be as close as possible to the S&P 500, right, but with a little bit of a, a sustainability shift, then that's going to be inside of it. Okay. Um, KLD, the other one, is a little bit more looking at the leaders. So they've got a stricter methodology. They only have 100 constituents, so it's not as diversified as DSI. There's still a pretty strong correlation. You know, it's uh, if the U.S. economy does well, both of these ETFs are going to do well. If the U.S. economy tanks, both of these ETFs are going to tank. Um, but KLD would be a little bit cleaner from a sustainability perspective. And rather than getting rid of the worst of the worst from each sector, it tends to focus more on including the best from within that sector. So it's more of a positive screen rather than a negative screen. Exactly. Okay. So that covers the US equities. Now, there, it's a little bit more difficult to find international equity uh, options. And there are a couple, again, from iShares that are US listed, but they're quite new. Can you tell us about the two sure. uh, for both developed and emerging countries? Absolutely. And this was a big gap in, in my model portfolios. Uh, when it came to international equity, for the longest time, there was no ETF. So we'd have to go with uh, an international equity mutual fund or find some other way of getting that exposure, which was higher cost and you know certainly not, not as in line with the indexing strategy. Uh, so really happy that now uh, iShares has these two different ETFs. One of them focuses on Europe, Australia, and the Far East. So the ticker symbol is ESGD, as in developed countries. And really, uh, again, now it's an interesting methodology. Rather than dropping off the worst of the worst, what they tend to do is they call it ESG optimized. Meaning, again, they screen all the companies for these ESG scores. And then what they do is they have an algorithm that weights the companies such that the companies with a higher sustainability score have a higher weighting in the portfolio. So when it comes to this methodology, there are still some companies in here that I don't like very much, but they're weighted much smaller relative to the traditional benchmark. So for me, it's at least it's a step in the right direction. Um, and then the, the other ETF in this space focuses on emerging markets. So the ticker symbol is ESGE. And that would have sort of all of our BRIC countries and a lot of the emerging markets. And again, it uses this ESG optimized approach. Right. And it's kind of nice because it is an algorithm. It does keep the MER quite low. So the fees are quite low on this. And it is a bit of a barrier because it can be hard for us to get a lot of the information and the data from a lot of these emerging market countries. But again, what they do is they score all the companies on this sustainability score. They overweight the ones with the higher sustainability score and they underweight the ones with a lower score. Okay. So we've covered all of the uh, major equity categories by geography, but I wanted to give you a chance to talk about a couple of funds that 
hold equities from various countries. It would be basically a global fund. And sure. there's a couple of different ones, again, depending on what your focus is. There's one devoted to companies that have a low carbon footprint, for yep. example. But one that uh, I've seen in your uh, model portfolios and that you like is called the PowerShares Clean Tech Portfolio. You the ticker it. is PZD. Why don't you tell us about that one? Sure. So a lot of the, the geographic ones we just spoke about, the language I use for that is those are doing less evil. Okay. Right. Those are those are the funds. They're still going to get you the large cap uh, uh, exposure to the companies that we really want to own to get that sort of those index returns. Now we're getting in the realm of what I call doing more good. So this is where it starts to deviate a little bit from the traditional indexing uh, uh, approach, because really what we're saying here is that we're going to carve out part of our portfolio for a bet on a sector or on a theme that we feel has a positive uh, social environmental impact, but also that is slated to grow. We're betting that it's going to grow faster than the overall market. So the PowerShares clean tech portfolio gets us exposure to a broad clean tech sector. So this is going to include everything from, I mean, everyone right away wants to talk about renewable energy and solar and wind, although those do tend to be some of the more volatile companies. Mm -hmm. There is some of that in here, but there's a much bigger and a broader focus on green technologies. So on things like uh, uh, electric cars and all the components and the batteries that go into those electric cars, on things like LED lighting. Right, We know how much more efficient mm. LED lights are. That's a massive growth industry when you think about all of these buildings that are going to need to replace their light bulbs over time. Um, looking at things like energy efficiency, water infrastructure, uh, environmental services is interesting because it, um, it focuses on this idea of recycling and using what's waste from one industry and actually using that as an input for another industry. So there are a lot of really interesting companies in this sector. Really what this is, is that we're going to carve out a deliberate part of our portfolio for what I call doing more good. And in this case, we would be making a choice to go overweight on this green sector. Right. So this isn't something that you would put 40% of your portfolio in. It would be Absolutely something that you'd not. carve off a small piece and uh, it's going a little bit outside the sort of broad asset classes and totally. just doing something a little more specialty. But um, again, you know, getting behind companies that you know, in this case, uh, are, are important to you to support them. Yeah. And also that I can get excited about. I mm -hmm. mean, I'm a giant nerd when it comes to this stuff. I don't know if you've realized, but uh, I love, you know, and, and understanding that we are going through this broad economic transition now that I want to understand and I want to invest. I want to own a piece of the companies that are leading this transition. You know, when I own an ETF that has Tesla inside of it and PZD doesn't, although there are some others that do, mm -hmm. um, I, I can really start cheering for that company. Right. And part of this for me is, is the psychology is that when my portfolio is aligned with my values, now I can do things like really start cheering for movement in this direction, because I know that not only does it benefit the world as we do things like uh, mitigate climate change risk, but also that my portfolio is benefiting from that and that I'm actually coming out ahead financially. Okay. So we've covered the equities. Now let's talk about the fixed income side of a balanced sure. portfolio. And in some ways, know, it's sort of easier or more difficult depending on where you want to go. Because it looks like there's there's really two ways you can play this. One is simply to buy a government bond ETF. So the right. most of the um, ETFs that I recommend in my model portfolios contain some combination of government and corporate bonds. And presumably if you're conscious about what companies you want to support. You don't want to be a lender to certain companies. And so you could just buy a government bond ETF yeah. unless you have an issue lending money to the Canadian government. Right. Uh, this is a pretty uh, pretty much morally neutral fund. Sure. And that would have functioned just fine as the fixed income. But the other way of doing this is to take a kind of more activist role. We talked earlier in the interview about how you know investing in a stock may or may not really be supporting you know, the company because you're simply buying a share that somebody else might own. But with lending, it's quite different because you actually are lending your money to the company That's and right. you're, you're helping to fund them. You're helping them to raise capital. And so you can take a more activist role and actually purchase certain types of bonds from companies uh, or organizations that you support. So let's talk a little bit about community bonds and how those work. Fantastic. Uh, so community bonds, again, this is part of it, what I would call doing more good. And again, we want to be deliberate about what percentage of our portfolio we want to allocate here. But community bonds are a way of earning a very 
uh, a stable financial fixed income return while supporting oftentimes nonprofits, although some of them are for-profits or co-ops uh, that are having a positive impact in our communities. So there are a number of different examples from this. They tend to be a little bit trickier. They're not, these aren't liquid investments. So oftentimes we're locked in from, you know, anywhere from 12 months up to five years. So we want to, again, be really deliberate about them. But they're a fantastic way to be able to support um, uh, uh, our community. Our, and so uh, some great examples in the renewable energy space would be an organization like SolarShare, which has been around for a very long time. They offer solar bonds. Um, $1,000 a bond, it pays 5% annual interest, right? Not bad in today's Not low interest all, rate environment. Presumably with some risk. That's but, it. Uh, yeah. And that, um, but you're supporting community owned uh, solar projects here in Ontario. Uh, Co-Power is one that's available national. So it's one of the first community bonds that's available nationally. And they're uh, again offering 5%. You're locked in for five years. But in their case, you're investing in LED retrofits of buildings. And I believe with their new round, you're also investing in geothermal energy projects, which for me are one of the coolest ways of generating heat. Very, very energy efficient. Right. Again, there is some risk. So you want to be able to look at it. We talk about the liquidity risk, the fact that you're locked in, the default risk. So you might want to do a little homework and look at the organization and look at the projects that you're actually investing in. Right. And then but also duration risk and interest rate risk, because right now, 5 percent seems great. But if interest rates go up in the next five years, Right. Well, you're, that 5% isn't going to seem as attractive right now. Yeah. Although it seems pretty unlikely they're going to go off higher than 5%. But I mean, I think the liquidity is the thing that you really need to be aware of. This is not uh, unlike an ETF. It's not something that you can sell six months from now if you need the money exactly. or if you want to rebalance the portfolio. Exactly. Um, so you're going to want to probably keep this to a relatively small part of your fixed income exactly. allocation. So the last thing I wanted to talk to you about, uh, Tim, was how you can implement a portfolio like this yourself. Now, this is one of the perennial problems uh, that I hear from inexperienced investors is just it can be a little bit difficult to build Absolutely. and maintain an ETF portfolio on your own. Uh, and I think when you add the additional challenge of trying to select um, SRI funds and you know, layer that on top of you know, your usual investing challenges, right. uh, it can be a little difficult. So uh, one of the solutions that uh, is appealing to some people is to work with a robo-advisor. Uh, robo-advisors, as most listeners will know, are online platforms, uh, organizations that will build and maintain an ETF portfolio for you. And a couple of them, uh, notably uh, Wealthsimple and Modern Advisor, actually have alternative SRI portfolio options for people who are interested in that. They can choose the regular portfolio or the SRI option. So let's talk a little bit about uh, robo-advisors in general and how sure. that option might work. And then maybe you can talk a little bit about those two specific offerings and what you like and don't like about them. Sure. So uh, I think robo-advisors are a really compelling option for people who, you know, frankly, can't be bothered to do it themselves. Right. If you're looking for the simplest and, you know, the easiest way. And I think there's a lot of value to this notion of default settings. So if you can create automated systems whereby your default setting is to put your money to work, then I think that's fantastic. Um, the, the, in terms of the looking at it through the sustainability lens, um, I would put Wealth Simple ahead. Um, just because it seems like they are looking at it from a bit more of a holistic portfolio perspective. Now, I definitely have some issues. And, you know, we talked earlier about the Jancy Social Index and some of these international ESG ETFs. And frankly, they don't go far enough for myself. Uh, and they don't go far enough for a lot of my clients. A lot of the people that I work with, they open up the companies inside and they just, they see companies in there that really don't sit well with them. So I would say that, you know, far be it for me to project my values, but that people should look at the ETFs inside each of these portfolios and make sure that they're comfortable with the companies that are in there. 
and and look at it, you know, through through their own lens and their own lens of ethics. Um, what I would say is that I think it's phenomenal that they offer the socially responsible investment option because all too often I I feel there's a lot of resistance in the traditional financial community. People think this is a bad idea, or in some cases they'll actively talk clients out of it, say no, 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 you shouldn't do this. It's you know somehow riskier, or it's you're going to lose money on it, even though those things aren't really true. So I, I do love the fact that they have these offerings. And what I'm really interested to see is, you know, to be able to track their performance over time. And, you know, when when we've got sort of a, a five-year track record, 10-year track record on some of these robo-advisor platforms, I'm pretty confident you're going to see that the socially responsible ones are going to come out at least as well and maybe even just a little bit ahead. All right. Tim, I really appreciate you joining us today and sharing all your insights on this subject. Thanks so much for having me. If you want to learn more about how you can combine index investing with socially responsible values, you should definitely pay a visit to Tim's site, sustainableeconomist.com. And if you're looking for someone who can coach you on how to be an ethical investor, Tim works directly with clients as well. You can contact him through his website. And now it's time for another edition of Bad Investment Advice where we look at how dumb ideas can lead investors astray. Back in 2007, the great Warren Buffett made a $1 million bet with Ted Sidis, who at the time ran an investment firm that selected hedge funds for its clients. Sidis wagered that he could select five hedge funds that would, on average, outperform an S&P 500 index fund over the next 10 years. Well, that 10-year period ends this December, and Mr. Sidis has already conceded defeat. As of the end of 2016, the S&P 500 had delivered an annualized return of 7.1% over nine years. Meanwhile, according to Fortune magazine, quote, the average for the five hedge funds whose names have never been made public is 2.2%, close quote. By the way, it's not like one or two dogs dragged down all of the others. All five hedge funds lagged by a wide margin. The best of the bunch grew at 5.6% annually, while the worst limped in at 0.3%. This million-dollar bet was back in the news in early May when Mr. Sidis published an article in Bloomberg in which he explained the reasons he had his head handed to him by a lowly index fund. I want to pick apart this article because it contains many of the same excuses that other active managers use to explain away their own underperformance. First, Sidus explains that he felt U.S. stocks were overvalued in 2008 when he made the bet, and he expected them to deliver disappointing returns over the next decade. But instead, they performed surprisingly well. The unexpected strength of the S&P 500 was a key contributor to Warren's victory, he writes, as if to say, it's not my fault, the market just behaved differently from how I thought it would. But that's precisely the point. The performance of markets is always unpredictable. If it were easy to buy when stocks look cheap and sell when they seemed expensive, then anyone could beat the index. But it's not that easy. Sidus confidently makes a bet about how stocks would perform based on his assessment of their valuation at the time. His call is absolutely wrong, and yet here he is framing this as, well, it made sense at the time. This is the same line of reasoning active managers fall back on when their macro calls are wrong, whether it's overvalued stocks or rising interest rates or a housing crash, so on. Instead of acknowledging that they have zero ability to forecast the future, They just offer up the hope that someday they'll be proven right. The insight for investors comes when they finally accept that it's futile to make these calls in the first place. Sidis then goes on to compare his bet with Buffett to a hand of Texas Hold'em. He argues that he started as the odds-on favorite, but Buffett caught a lucky card to win. If you play only one hand, anything can happen, he writes. The player with the better cards may lose, even if he should win. This offends me as a poker player, let alone as an investor. Sidus starts with the assumption that his hedge funds were the odds-on favorite to beat the market. He actually estimated his chances of winning the bet at 85%, even though the evidence is overwhelming that most hedge funds do no such thing. He talks like he was holding a pair of aces when at best he held queen-nine offsuit. What's more pathetic is the market crash of 08-09 actually did make him the favorite. 
Hedge funds can easily play defense by moving to cash when markets tank, and that's what they did. So early on, in the bet when the S&P 500 sank like a stone, hedge funds were in much better shape. Sidus might have started with a crappy queen nine, but he hit two pair on the flop. And yet even with that head start, he still went on to lose spectacularly. And how does he justify saying that his bet with Buffett was playing one hand, even though it spanned 10 years and he got to select five different funds, all of which lagged the benchmark? Speaking of benchmarks, Sidus then argues that the S&P 500 is an inappropriate measure of a hedge fund's performance. The index includes only large U.S. stocks, while hedge funds have a much bigger investment universe. They can invest in stocks large and small from around the world, as well as alternative investments and pretty much anything else they want to. So it's an apples to oranges comparison, he says. Moreover, during the last nine years, the S&P 500 did very well compared to broader benchmarks. It was global diversification that hurt hedge fund returns more than fees, Sidus writes. In fact, a low-cost index of large global companies, the MSCI All Country World Index, almost exactly matched hedge fund returns during the same nine-year period of our bet, close quote. Hey, I agree the S&P 500 is not an appropriate benchmark for anything other than large U.S. stocks. But if Sidus felt that way, he should have refused to have taken the bet back in 2008, or he should have suggested a more representative index. On the contrary, remember, he specifically took the bet because he felt U.S. stocks were overvalued. If you do that, and then you declare that your odds are 85% to win, you don't get to cry foul after you lose. I'd also point out that the best Sidus can do here is argue that a global stock index almost exactly matched hedge fund returns. You know, I wish I had the opportunity to collect huge fees from my investors, pick a benchmark after the fact, and then pat myself on the back for delivering the same results they could have achieved with an index fund. That's a very low bar indeed. Okay, next excuse. Sidus says that investors had to buy and hold the S&P 500 for nine years to enjoy that 7.1% annual return, and that many would have bailed during the difficult times along the way. He's right about that. But then he says, hedge fund investors stood a much better chance of staying the course and earning the returns on the rebound, even if those returns were less than those of the index fund. This statement is presented as fact with zero evidence to back it up. In his book, The Quest for Alpha, Larry Swedro demonstrates that institutional investors, who are the primary clients of hedge funds, have a long history of chasing performance, not maintaining discipline during times of volatility. Pension funds and endowments regularly review the performance of the managers they hire, and when those managers fail to deliver over periods as short as a few years, they get fired. If the five hedge funds selected by Sidus lagged the S&P 500 by almost five percentage points a year since 2008, what's the likelihood that an investment committee would have held on to those funds, despite their appalling performance? Are we really to believe that active investors would have shown that kind of patience, when their very expensive hedge funds were being crushed by an index fund? As for individuals who invest in index funds, hey, they're certainly prone to panic selling and bad behavior, but are they really less disciplined than hedge fund investors? Well, as it happens, a few years ago, Vanguard looked at more than 58,000 investors who held self-directed retirement accounts with them between 2008 and 2012, a period that not only included the brutal crash of 0809, but also the European debt crisis of 2011. Vanguard compared the returns of these investors to a pair of balanced benchmarks and found that, quote, for the most part, investors fared reasonably well by choosing low-cost investments and staying the course, even in the midst of a turbulent investment period. Now, if all this weren't enough, what really stands out is how Sidus ends his little apologia. He's just spent the whole article acknowledging that he made a big bet with great confidence and was spectacularly wrong, but instead of being humbled, he wants a rematch. The S&P 500 looks overpriced and has a reasonable chance of disappointing passive investors, he writes, echoing the same bad call he made a decade ago. Investing in hedge funds is a bet against a continuing bull market. Investing in the S&P 500 is a bet on a continuing bull market. So in other words, he's saying, I have a decade-long track record of being dead wrong and my investors have suffered dearly for it, but you should continue to pay me excessive fees to make forecasts. <laughs> 
So no, Mr. Seidis, investing in index funds is not a bet on a continuing bull market. It's a bet that hedge funds like yours will continue to fail their investors by subtracting value with their bad investment advice. And that brings us to our Ask the Spud segment, where we answer your questions about index investing. And with me in the studio, as always, is my friend and colleague, Amanda DL, who's sitting behind a huge stack of letters. So Amanda, how about we pick one at random and see what it says? All right, let's see what we have here. Okay, so today's question comes from Remy. I want to move away from my stocks and mutual funds in order to build a couch potato portfolio with ETFs. What is the best way to do this? Should I sell all at once and pay all of the taxes this year, or should I sell my assets over a longer period, like two to three years? Thanks for the question, Remy. This is a pretty common situation. An investor has built a portfolio, probably over many years, and it's just a collection of random ingredients rather than the product of a well-thought-out plan. So now he's ready to scrap it in favor of a more disciplined approach, but he's not sure whether to clean house and do it all at once or take a more gradual approach. This decision is an easy one if all of your investments are in RSPs and TFSAs because there's no tax consequences to selling your existing holdings. It's probably best to just liquidate the whole portfolio now. But Remy is investing in a non-registered account, and if he's held his stocks in mutual funds for several years, he's probably sitting on large unrealized capital gains, and selling these securities would result in a significant tax bill. For example, if his stocks and funds had increased in value by $50,000 and Remy is in a 40% tax bracket, selling them all at once would result in a tax bill of about $10,000. So the question is, does it make sense to realize these gains all at once and pay the taxes this year, or should you try to spread out that tax bill over a couple of years instead? Now the answer will depend on individual circumstances, but here's how I suggest you approach the problem. First, how risky are the securities you hold now? Let's say you're looking to replace a well-diversified but expensive U.S. equity mutual fund with a much cheaper ETF. In this situation, the mutual fund is not a ticking time bomb that could blow up your portfolio. It's just too expensive. So here's a place where it might make sense to sell the fund gradually over two or three calendar years, spreading out the tax bill by doing so. If the gain is very large, the benefit of the tax deferral might well outweigh the difference in fees between the mutual fund and the ETF. And chances are that mutual fund is going to move more or less in step with the broad market anyway. But now consider a situation where you hold three or four small cap tech stocks with large gains, and your goal is to diversify by replacing these with a total market ETF. Now I would recommend selling the stocks immediately because holding a small number of individual companies puts you at risk of very large losses and completely undermines your goal of building a more diversified portfolio. So consider yourself fortunate that you picked a few stocks that did well, but now it's time to dump them and move on. Second, think about what your tax rate will be next year. Tax deferral can be a valuable thing, but it's only worth so much if you'll be in the same tax bracket for the foreseeable future. So let's say liquidating your whole portfolio today would result in a tax bill of $10,000. Sure, you could sell half this year and half next year. And assuming the value of the holdings didn't change, you'd pay $5,000 in taxes this year and another $5,000 next year. Either way, you pay the same total amount. And what's the real value of deferring half the taxes for another 12 months? I'd argue it's not very much. But again, it depends on your situation. Maybe you plan to take a sabbatical or a parental leave next year, which would put you in a lower tax bracket. That would be an argument for deferring the whole gain until next year because you would be taxed much more favorably at that time. On the other hand, if you're in line for a promotion and you expect to be in a higher tax bracket next year, it would make more sense to realize the entire gain now and report it in a year when you'll pay less tax. Now remember, if your portfolio is very large, liquidating it all at once will likely push you into a higher tax bracket. So now we're not just talking about deferring tax for a year or two, you might actually pay significantly less tax overall if you spread the gain out over two or three years. So use an online tax calculator to run some numbers or ask your accountant for help. Finally, what time of year is it? 
If it's January or February and you sell only half your stocks and funds to defer some of the gains, you're going to need to wait until next January to sell the remainder. And a lot can happen in those intervening 11 or 12 months. So this is an argument for just selling everything all at once. However, if you're overhauling your portfolio and it's November or December, it probably does make sense to realize half the gains now and half in the new year because now you're only waiting a few weeks to get that tax deferral. In fact, if you have very large capital gains, you might have an opportunity here to spread them out over three calendar years. You could sell a third of the holdings in December, another third a few weeks later in the new year, and then the rest the following January. Now what you've done is you've spread the gains over three tax years while making all of the transactions in a period of less than 14 months. So those are some of the factors to consider in the decision, but overall my recommendation is to sell your existing holdings and transition to your new index portfolio as soon as you can. Deferring taxes can make sense, but don't ignore the behavioral pitfalls of hanging on to your old holdings. Believe me, you will be tempted to resort to your old ways if one of your stocks has another good year. You'll start to question your decision to make the switch, and then when the time comes next year to sell the stock as planned, you'll probably be tempted to wait a little longer, and then the next thing you know, you've lost your way, and you're back to being a stock picker. One final note. Don't forget that if you do realize significant capital gains in one tax year, you may be able to recover some of those taxes in the future. So let's say that Remy liquidates his whole portfolio this year and realizes $10,000 in gains. Then next year, there's a sharp downturn in the markets. Remy finds that his new ETF portfolio is showing an unrealized loss of $5,000. He could sell the ETFs that have fallen in value and immediately replace them with very similar ETFs. That would allow him to realize a capital loss of $5,000, which he could report on his next tax return and apply to have it carried backward to offset some of the gains he reported in the previous year. This is a technique called tax loss harvesting, and it's very easy to do with ETFs. I'm going to provide some links on my blog if you're interested in learning more about how it works. I hope that answers your question, Remy. Remember, if you've got an investing question for Dan, please send it to mail at canadiancouchpotato.com, and he may answer it on an upcoming podcast. That's it for this episode. On our next podcast, I'll be joined by Tom Bradley of Steady Hand Investment Funds. Tom is a dyed-in-the-wool active manager, not an indexer, but we thought it would be fun to discuss the many ways that the whole active versus passive debate can overshadow the more important ingredients of a successful investment plan, like low-cost, diversification, and long-term discipline. Plus, it's my show, so if he makes me look bad, I'll just edit out his comments. In the meantime, visit CanadianCouchPotato.com for links and notes from this episode, as well as hundreds more articles and resources on index investing. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.